Hello English 10 students. Today we're looking at, in our argumentative unit, types of evidence. So these are types of evidence that not only will you be trying to use, but also looking for in the arguments that we'll be analyzing throughout this course. So there are these things called appeals, and what that means is if something's appealing, right, like let's say I see this delicious looking cheesecake with a little blueberry drizzle on it, very fancy looking and just delicious. That appeals to me, right? So the same thing kind of happens with people when they hear an argument, right? There are going to be appeals that they'll either respond to positively, negatively, or maybe even neutrally, maybe apathy. So one of the first logical types of appeals are facts and statistics. And these tend to be very strong. There is a huge emphasis on numbers, on factual information, um, but you do need to make sure they're coming from a reliable source because, of course, you know, people can play with numbers. If you've ever taken a statistics class, you can see how they can be manipulated to be a little misleading. So you just want to make sure that source is a good, credible source that's known for not doing sneaky things. All right. So I'm going to show you the fact and the statistic, and I want you to see that the statistics tend to be a little more, they get to the point a little better, I think. All right. So the fact is that a lot of people don't wash their hands after using the bathroom. That's kind of freaky, especially, you know, if you're eating out and someone uses the restroom and they don't wash their hands and they're handling your food. You know, we have issues with things like hepatitis or all sorts of other nasty things you don't want to get from people who don't wash their hands. But look at the statistic now. The global rate, that's all across the world, for washing hands after using the toilet is under 20%. So if you look around the room, and there are 10 people in the room, about two of those 10 people maybe wash their hands. Now I'm hoping that living in a, a country like we do that's technologically advanced, that perhaps we're a country where this happens more, and by this I mean washing hands, but that's kind of a scary statistic. But it caught my eye for certain. And so these are the kinds of things you're looking for when you're looking to back things up are things that really are significant like this. All right, so a fact is that many Americans don't read well and are considered nearly functionally illiterate, meaning they can read a little bit, but not enough to, you know, perhaps fill out an important form they need for the DMV. All right, now here comes the statistic for that. More than 36 million U.S. adults cannot read above a third grade level. So now we've gotten very specific about this. And there's something about specific, specificity, that's kind of a hard word to say, um, that people tend to feel like that's expert information instead of a generalization, such as many Americans don't read well. Now we have some specifics here. All right. Mental illness is common these days. Why, yes, you know, there are a lot of people with different disorders and, and such, but check out this statistic. Nearly half of all American adults will experience a mental illness during their lifetime. Half. Holy moly. Look around La Paloma. Look at all of us teachers. Think about that. Let that sink in a minute. That's kind of scary. And I don't mean to shame any of that because it's very common in our society, as you can see. But that also means that it's very difficult for some people just to get by on a day to day basis. All right, to a happier thing here, we have examples. Now, I kind of think examples fall in the same realm as, as facts, but, you know, oftentimes you'll see it delineated differently. So I'm just going to give you both here. All right, so you're backing up your point using an example. So if we think about Nelson Mandela, who um, was a South African man, he sacrificed much of his life to support Africans after the British came in and colonized South Africa. Now, we want to back that up with some kind of example that shows this sacrifice he made. He was sentenced to life in prison for plotting against the government when he advocated for civil rights and equality for Africans. And that's just wild to be basically called a traitor, to get a life sentence in prison. He actually spent 27 years 
before things changed and they ended up letting him out. But what a waste, you know, to have this man who was a great man being stuck in prison for so many years. That's quite the sacrifice. All right. Now we get to ethos and we'll be looking more at words like pathos, pathos, ethos, logos. Sorry if I say pathos. Um, that's actually a type of plant and it's one of my favorites. So I mean pathos. All right. So ethos is to cite an expert, right? So if you think about someone who's an expert in a field, you can use a direct quote or if maybe the quote's really long and you just need a part of it, you can paraphrase it in your own words to say this is what this person was saying. All right. And you want to make sure that this person either is educated in their field or has worked in their field. They need to have some kind of experience so that they're not just touting something they read in a textbook, for example, or just their opinion that isn't backed up. All right. You also want to make sure this is someone who isn't, you know, financially invested in what's going on. So, for example, if you have someone, maybe you have a dentist who's saying this particular toothpaste is the best toothpaste because it has this special proprietary blend, um, but then you find out that person's being paid by Crest, for example, then you know that mm, their words are a little weak then. They have an interest in what they're saying that goes beyond just trying to help people. All right. So if you think about this, I just saw this on um, here today. Many doctors and researchers link vaping with COVID complications. All right. So many doctors, we're now again being kind of general, but it takes more life on when you actually cite a specific person who would know this kind of thing. So according to Dr. Bonnie Halpern Felsher, Stanford professor of pediatrics, young people who vape not only experience significantly worse symptoms and outcomes with COVID, but also contract it at a much higher rate than their non-smoking peers. So I took what she was saying, which was basically this, and I put it in my own words. And so I've got, you know, her name here, but I'm also showing why we should listen to her, right? Stanford is a pretty prestigious place, especially medically and especially for pediatrics. And here she is a Stanford professor of pediatrics. So this is really giving some life to the fact that it's not just many doctors. We got a person here who's saying, hey, this is a problem. All right. Now we get to pathos and pathos is an appeal to the emotion, emotional appeal. We got a lot of words for the same thing. That's the English language for you. So an anecdote is usually a true story and you're illustrating some by some point. And the reason that these work really well is because it appeals to people's emotions, right? So while we would love to think we're all rational and logical and whatnot, we all also have an emotional side to us. It's just how the brain is wired. I could talk about that for days, but I won't. So usually you're just trying to get someone to listen and really think about the effects of the issue. So you want to show what the impact is on either you or someone you personally know. Now, sometimes you can use an anecdote from, you know, a friend of a friend, but it's much, much, much stronger if it's you or your mother or your brother or, you know, someone you know well that you can verify this person's speaking truth. All right, so in this anecdote, let's pretend we're trying to argue that it's important to buy organic produce. Not that I do, it is more expensive, but you know, ideally. So the anecdote I might cite is when my friend was diagnosed with cancer, she knew major changes were in store for her after adopting many healthy practices, such as buying only organic fruits and vegetables. She is now happily in remission and the healthiest she has ever been. And actually true story. Um, which is the whole point here, right? So if I'm trying to convince you to buy organic, of course, you'd assume I would be buying organic. Um, and that's kind of how you use an anecdote. It's, you're just going to relate it to your point, tell the story. And I notice that you guys are really good at this. Whenever we've had class discussions, um, teenagers are very good at pulling anecdotes up. All right. Now more more pathos, we get to case studies. Case studies are a lot like anecdotes in some respect. However, really it's used as evidence. So if, for example, I wanted to see what is the result of distance learning on our students at La Paloma, I could do it a couple different ways. Well, many different ways. I could do a study where I'm taking a, 
all of La Paloma students, and I'm looking at all the credits that have or haven't been earned over the period of time and comparing them to past and running some statistics to show, you know, what's happening and also working in, I could do some focus groups where I'm asking students to give me reasons this is happening, or I could cite other studies that show why this is happening. But a case study, and this is kind of one of my favorites, to be honest with you, because it's so much more personalized and more nuanced and more subtle. But a case study is when you use one person or a small group of people, and you're trying to prove or disprove your point by using what these people have experienced, right? So you research a subject, and by a subject, I mean a person, right? So let me, let's say I wanted to do, you know, how distance learning affect people with depression, right? So one thing I could do is I could find a student who has had chronic depression, and I could start asking them questions, interview them, you know, write down what their experiences have been like, I could then also, if they have like a journal or anything like that, a diary, you know, they could go through that and tell me a little bit about that. Um, but basically you just really get to know one or a few people well in order to see what they're experiencing, right? Now, just be aware that every single type of study that is done, whether it's quantitative, meaning you're working numbers, maybe I have a thousand people that I'm following to see how often they buy white bread. Maybe I'm doing a study on white bread. I don't know. But um, it's going to have its flaws, just as doing a case study on one person who buys white bread would have its flaws, right? We'll get to how to overcome some of those flaws in a minute here. Not that I expect you guys to conduct a case study. This is more like at your level, you guys might read a case study or know of a case study that you could document. Maybe you watched a documentary on, who, who did I just recently see? I don't know, pretend it's Steve Jobs. And you could use that as a case study, right? You wouldn't have to conduct the case study, you would use it as it already is. All right, and so an anecdote is a story, whereas a case study is kind of documented and they're analyzed to make sure that they're accurate. All right. Now this particular book, oh my gosh, I love this book, Hiroshima by John Hersey. And he went over to Hiroshima in Japan after we dropped the bomb on it to see what were the aftermath on the people who survived the bomb. And so he followed six different people and had their stories, talked to them, asked them questions, wrote down what they experienced. And then I want to say it was like 10 years later, he went back and tried to find these six people and continue their story of, you know, what are they doing now 10 years after the bomb dropped? How is their health now? How are they being impacted by radiation and things of that nature? Really fascinating. This is, um, <laughs> in fact, this led to a lot of crime, his book, because people were actually, you know, trying to get a copy of this book and it sold out so fast they just couldn't even keep it in print long enough. I mean, if you ever have a chance to read it, it is a hard read, I am gonna admit, but you get to really kind of know intimately the effects. Like um, if you were wearing a printed shirt and you were near the flash of the bomb and you lived, your shirt would be printed on your body like a tattoo. Pretty wild. All right. The other thing to consider is when you're using evidence in your own work, think about the fact that you want to use different types, not just don't rely all on one type, right? So to make your argument strong, you want to have different things going on here, right? So you might want to think to yourself, how can I appeal to people's desire to hear logic, right? Well, statistics, facts, examples that we know of. How can I appeal to their emotions? How might people feel about this? How can I get them to feel the way I want them to feel in order to listen to what I have to say? And then finally, what kind of trusted expert would have something to say that would support what I'm trying to say? So if I'm trying to say that let's make alcohol illegal, we'll ban it in all 50 states, then I'm going to look for someone, maybe a doctor or maybe an ethics professor or somebody or maybe even a police officer who has seen many DUIs. I'm going to find someone who's going to support my stance so I can cite 
what they have to say to back myself up because I, I am not a person who works in any of those fields. Alrighty, guys. If at any point you need to rewatch it, please do. You should be um, submitting your notes right into Canvas then. And have a great day.